Welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. Another in the security stories line. And a lot of you have been asking to do one just on doorman, bouncers, you know, what they're like, what they're really like, uh, whether or not they're all on steroids, whether or not they've all got issues, you know, all these different questions. Obviously, a lot of people have had some bad experiences with doorman. And uh, I'm going to attempt to answer some of those questions. I think you'll probably be surprised at my response maybe not but i was quite widely disliked by a, a vast majority probably of the the door guys that i worked with all the bouncers that i got to know and so i've got a fairly balanced viewpoint on it you know i'm not someone who was in the industry or came out of the industry with rose tinted glasses on believing that everyone was fantastic you know, I've had some pretty negative experiences in that industry with colleagues and uh, people that I may be at classed as friends or acquaintances at some point. So I think I've got a, a pretty reasonable outlook on it. Also, I would mention that my experiences were now quite a long time ago. You know, the last time I worked the doors was probably about 2010 and things have gone rapidly downhill since then in terms of competency capability and just the the general style and behavior of door staff security staff and i'll talk about that a little bit later in the video so some of the things i'm saying might not be relevant to today's bouncers and door staff so when i think about door staff i often think about police as well because it's a quite a similar career you know in terms of people being attracted to wanting to do a career You've got to look at their reasons for that, you know, the motivation that they would have to want to become that thing, that person. And why do people want to get a job in the security industry? Well, certainly when I was doing it, there were some very specific categories of people that looked to work in the industry. You had guys that genuinely wanted to be helpful, you know, that they were physically capable and competent guys. And they, for whatever reason, felt that they wanted to be able to help members of the public have a safe evening. They were in the minority. Let's get that straight, you know, and I think that's probably similar with the police. That's the common misconception that everyone believes that security guys and police guys all join up because they're great people and they want to do their best for the community or whatever. That sounds very nice, but I think that makes up a, a minority of the people, and it certainly did in the security industry. The next kind of people, and I think probably the most common, and this is one of the big problems with the industry when I was in it, was that the type of guys that wanted to join up were guys that were kind of bullies, that wanted to throw their weight around, that maybe didn't have authority or control in some of the other aspects of their lives and they saw this job as an opportunity to gain that control and authority you know just by doing a, a simple couple of days course they could now boss people around and use physical violence on people and maybe get away with it in some cases you had quite a few guys also that were attracted to it from a kind of sexual aspect you know they saw it as a way to interface with young ladies and sometimes men uh, but they seemed to think it was a doorway to kind of uh, having relationships or sexual encounters and that ranged from being fairly harmless you know i met a lot of young guys that started on the door and they said oh this is great you know i get to meet loads of girls and it was pretty innocent they would genuinely meet girls and have a nice time and then there were some kind of guys that were very, very creepy. And uh, I'll kind of get into some of that. I've got a couple of stories that sort of outline some of that stuff. But that's genuinely what I found was the kind of motivations in general for people joining up. There was also separate to that a organised criminal element, which wasn't so much, I guess, a, a motivation for a career, but it just happened to be a useful tool for criminals that if they could join up and become you know head of door or working in clubs and pubs that they could then control drugs going in and out of these large venues and that would obviously give them a great place to make money so really the door work and the 
uh, security aspect was completely secondary to those guys from the fact that they just wanted to seize the opportunity to ply drug trade. That was also reasonably common, I've got to say. So let's address the kind of bullyish guys because I kind of fell into the trade. Um, I think I've mentioned this before in a video, you know, I was just in a club. I was only 17 and I'd helped out the door guys a couple of times when things had kicked off and they offered to give me some money, you know, and come in. Basically, I could go in, do what I normally did in the club. And at the same time, they would pay me some money to help out when things kicked off. And then I just fell into the job. So I was pretty unusual. I didn't meet many other doormen that started like that. Most of them wanted to be doormen. And uh, a lot of them were in the kind of bully authority situation. And those tended to be the guys I really, really didn't get on well with. Because a lot of the time they had a bad attitude. A lot of the time they weren't particularly bright. And they were very see-through, you know, in their motivation. I kind of got their uh, MO as soon as I got chatting to them, you know. And they often would talk to me and in encourage me to kind of uh, join in with their banter about beating people up and pushing people around. And the other issue I had, you know, I would do security work as it was meant to be done. So... If I was told, you know, you don't let criminals in, we don't want ex-violent drug dealers in, this specific gang is banned from the venue, I wasn't going to let them in, you know, and I would have died on the door stopping those guys coming in. But a lot of the bully doormen would, if someone was turning up, a gang of guys turned up and they were very intimidating and they scared the doorman, the doorman would let them in. If a bunch of students turned up and got a little bit rowdy and out of hand, the doorman would beat the absolute crap out of them. So they were kind of cherry picking where they were pushing their authority, you know, and my thoughts on it was authority should be unbiased and it should be just replicated across the board. So you have a set of rules on the door and you apply them to the people that turn up on that door. It shouldn't matter you know, how tough they are, who they are, who they know, who they're connected to, because we always had that. There was constantly gangs of guys turning up that would drop names and say to me, I'm a friend of X, Y, and Z. And they would normally name, you know, really big drug dealers and stuff like that, expecting that to have some weight with me. And the fact of the matter was, because of security work, I knew most of these guys that they were talking about, and because I trained in gyms, I trained with a lot of the guys they were talking about. So I would say that's fine. You know, if you want to uh, ring that guy and, and send him down there to have a word with me and beat me up, go ahead. But I'm still not letting you in the door. And normally those guys would ring me up and uh, say a couple of dudes had just phoned me saying I need to come down and have a word with you. And I'm not going to, you know, and I told the dudes to shut up and uh, they'll probably go away. But that's not how a lot of these kind of... Uh, but mini Hitler doorman would behave, you know, the authoritarians, they would throw their weight around and if you intimidated them enough on the door, they would basically just fold and let these guys come in. I would get very annoyed about that because if I was working on the inside of a club and suddenly I had 10 or 20 violent guys that I didn't particularly want in that club and I knew that they had got past the guys on the door and just intimidated their way in, I would then go out and give the guys on the door absolute hell. I would be asking them what the hell they thought they were doing. And, uh, you know, that I would tell them straight, you're doing a, a shit job, you're cowards, and uh, you haven't impressed me. And uh, if I could, I would get rid of these guys. You know, some of the doors I ran and I had the ability to just get rid of the people that were making those choices. In the end, by the end of the, the time I was running doors, I would have teams of guys with me that were incredibly competent, very capable. And uh, they, you know, these were guys that had a background in fighting or a military background. They had nothing to prove. You know, they knew they could handle themselves. They didn't need to go around bullying people. They weren't frightened of names and people dropping, you know, drug dealing references and whatever. They weren't scared of anyone and they would stand on the door and judge everyone as I was judging them, which was fairly and reasonably. But uh, I didn't always I didn't always have the uh, ability to get rid of people. Sometimes I worked in venues for someone else and I would have to just work 
with the colleagues that I was given. So that would be frustrating. And hence why a lot of the guys hated my guts because I kind of told them how it was and uh, I made it pretty clear I wasn't intimidated by them. I'll give you a little story and this is a bizarre story but this summarises the kind of characters that I would tend to meet in the security industry that made up a fairly large portion of it. I was running a really small club and I had requirements for a member of staff. I couldn't get hold of one permanently at the time so I had a temporary guy come down. This guy turned out to be an immigrant from Syria. Turns up the first day three quarters of an hour late. So already I'm not very impressed but it's his first day Maybe, you know, he's got a good excuse, so I cut him a bit of slack. And he tells me that on the way there, he had to stop off and go to a boxing tournament. So already I'm thinking, this sounds, you know, somewhat far-fetched. And he tells me that he was on the way to work and he saw a, you know, guy in the street motioning people to pull over and they were asking people if they could do boxing because one of the boxers hadn't turned up and they desperately needed someone to step in. And this guy was able to step in and he quickly won a boxing match on his way to work. Despite the fact he was not sweating, you know, he showed no signs of having been in a fight. He weighed about eight and a half stone, which uh, for American guys is, you know, about 120 pounds or something. And he didn't look like he could fight his way out of a wet paper bag. So I say to him directly, look, I don't believe you. You know, I'm not an idiot. And uh, j just make sure you're on time next time. I could, you know, and I kind of had to laugh because for someone to make up such a far-fetched story uh, is laughable. You know, I don't know how else to say it. It was such a ridiculous thing to come out and say. And then this guy, you know, over a period of a couple of weeks, he turned up late again the next week by about half an hour. And, you know, that pisses me off. And the next week he's telling me stories that he used to spray motorbikes with these amazing spray jobs like an airbrush guy. And he would get paid £900 an hour. And I met a lot of door staff like this. You know, they would all be, always be telling you that they had these amazing jobs. That, oh, normally I work in close protection for some famous celebrity and I get paid, you know, £1,500 a, every half day or whatever. And the fact of the matter was that they were standing on the door with me for about £15 an hour. So I don't know why they thought I would believe that they were earning all these crazy amounts of money and then they would come and stand on the door with me for like eight hours in the freezing cold for £15 an hour. But there we go. So you had these kind of Walter Mitty guys that were clearly blaggers you know none of them could fight none of them were particularly competent they just blagged their way into the industry and they thought they were telling me the sort of things I would want to hear it was frankly embarrassing then you had some guys that like I said were the sort of bully type so I ended up getting rid of this Syrian guy because he was useless and he was actually annoying me because he, he lied so often that I just ran out of patience I can only listen to someone talk shit to me for so long so I said, look, you know, the gig's up here, mate. I don't need a, a member of staff here anymore. I've got someone permanent coming in. And I just got rid of him. He then went and worked in a club up the road. And the club up the road was run by some guys that I knew that I would wave to, but I didn't particularly like. Um, the guy that was actually the head doorman there, I had worked with previously. He actually worked at the strip club with me, which I've made a, a video about. And I fell out with him at that strip club. And I'll go back to that story quickly just to give you an idea on what this guy was like. So one time at the strip club, we had about 25 guys turn up and they were on a pre-booking. They would booked as like a stag group and we let them in. I was not keen to let them in. You know, when they arrived at the door and I went and opened the door, I went down to the boss in the strip club and I said, look, I know these guys are trouble, you know, they're clearly uh, going to be a problem and I think that we should refuse entry. And the manager said, look, we've already taken payment, you know, they've paid a deposit, we need the money, I want to let them in and you're the security guy, you're going to get rid of them if they kick off. And I said, look, there's too many of them, I can't get rid of them all, I've got one guy with me and uh, if they kick off, we're going to be in big trouble. And the manager said, I don't care, I want them in, you know, so... He has the final say. I could have walked out, but I stayed. I let these guys in. Turns out these guys were football hooligans. They were from the Chelsea 
headhunters, they all had CFC tattooed on the inside of their lips, which they showed me about an hour later. So I was really pleased to see that. And of course, they started getting out of hand. They started drinking too much. They started groping all the girls and, and making, you know, rude comments to the girls and stuff. So the girls then started refusing to come out of the changing rooms and refused to go anywhere near these guys. At which point I sort of have to get rid of these guys. So I have another doorman. He's standing over in the corner and uh, he hasn't been much use. These guys are all shouting, chanting football songs. So I jump up on a table and basically shout really loudly and just say, listen up, you're going. The girls have all gone in. None of them, none of the girls are coming back out and you're leaving. And if you don't leave, I'm going to start chucking you out. So, of course, they all start saying they're going to kill me. There's 28 of them. You know, I'm only one guy. I've got another guy with me. So I'm pretty sure that they are going to kill me. So I'm blagging it, really. And I said, look, you can kill me, but you're literally going to have to kill me because now we're going to start going at it. And you're going to have to knock me unconscious or kill me. And after that, I'm pretty sure the police will turn up and nick you all. And they're going to ruin your whole weekend. They'd obviously come to Brighton for the weekend. And uh, one of the, the big guys, that I think the leader of them, sort of came over to me. I'm standing on this table shouting at them. He said, oh, I like you. You know, you got some balls. And he sort of shook my hand. And he said, look, look you know, calm down. I'll, I'll take care of the guys. I'm going to get them out. If you can have a word with one of the bigger clubs in town and get us kind of in there, a place that can handle us being a bit rowdy and whatever, then, you know, let's sort of do it that way. So there was a couple of really big clubs in town that had like huge door teams and I spoke to them and I said, look, these guys are super boisterous. Uh, do you want them down there? And they said, yeah, sure, we'll take them, you know, because they had those sort of groups all the time. So I ended up sending these guys off to another club and the, the head guy was super friendly with me you know trying to buy me beer and all that so it worked out well my blag my bluff had worked and uh, i was just relieved that i didn't get weighed in but when i turned around after that firstly the doorman that was supposed to be backing me up had disappeared the manager of the club who had made me let these guys in in the first place i found crouching down the, uh, under a table in the kitchen clutching some pepper spray and he said oh don't worry you know I was ready for him <laughs> I, uh, I don't think he was going to come out of that kitchen if I'd have started getting beaten up he then asked where's the other guy and I said I don't know you know I turned around and he's disappeared we found this other guy halfway down the street and he had walked off to get a portion of chips or something in the middle of all this so obviously he got scared and disappeared you know and then came up with some lame excuse and the manager fair play he actually sacked this guy on the spot he said you you know you're a coward you've left this guy on his own he could have got killed and uh, and you've walked off to get some food so i don't want you here anymore so pretty cool the manager did that the guy then went off to run this other club so he's running this club down the road i didn't particularly like him for those reasons and was, this syrian guy has then gone off and got a job there every weekend that door team, this guy that I didn't like and his cronies would walk past me and they would normally stop for a couple of minutes, you know, and have a chat about what was going on that night or whatever. Tell me what had happened in the club the week before at their place. And they said, oh, this uh, Syrian guy, you know, they, they, they didn't like him, that they sort of quickly found out he was a bit of a idiot, a bit of a liar. And I said, yeah, you know, he's a pain. I don't want him working for me. So... Every week they started giving me an update on what they were up to and the things they did to this guy were completely outrageous. So the first thing they were doing was they pretended that they were actually a girl and they were messaging him on his phone. They got his number because of the work contact and they were messaging as a girl on his phone trying to encourage him to you know, talk sexy or whatever. Then it came to them encouraging him to send rude pictures and rude videos so they actually got videos and pictures of him um, playing with himself with a, a bacon in his hand because this guy was Muslim. So they thought it was hilarious to utilize bacon in the whole process. They had pictures and videos of him wearing like fishnet tights, doing things with like pieces of ham. They had another of him having sex with a piece of fruit. It's like crazy stuff and uh, they were trying to show me these things and I was like guys I'm not interested you know you really you've got some serious issues 
if you're actually getting another dude to send you that kind of stuff very very uh these were classic kind of like closet homosexual aggressive door guys that had not been able to address obviously their own issues with their own sexualities and they pretended that they hated gays but they were quite happy to persuade a guy to send them pictures of gay stuff so they do this then they arrange for this syrian lad you know with this girl on the phone that they've invented to meet for a date in paris so unbelievably this syrian who was obviously naive he actually goes to paris to have a date with this girl of course she doesn't turn up she's fictional she doesn't actually exist and uh, you know this stuff carries on and on and i said to him you know you you shouldn't be doing this i don't like the guy but he doesn't deserve that kind of treatment so they actually had a plan to link all these pictures and videos up into one big video and then during the staff Christmas party, they were going to play this thing on a big screen in front of everyone. And I begged them, I said, you know, you cannot do that to someone because if you do that, that guy could work very well go and commit suicide because you've just humiliated him beyond imaginable humiliation. You know, you've religiously, culturally humiliated him. You've absolutely made him a laughing stock and i can't imagine what that would do to someone and and to get it straight this guy wasn't the syrian guy was not pleasant he's the same syrian guy that thought that girls should be placed in a stress position if they wore short skirts and in his country he said that they would shoot him in the head so he was not a nice guy but i don't care who people are i don't think that's the way to to deal with someone who's not a nice guy so uh you know, I didn't like any of those guys. I don't know what I left that club and I don't actually know what happened after that. I never saw any of those guys again. I moved to a completely different area and started working there. But that kind of gives you a, a little bit of an idea on what was going on. In another club I worked at, uh, after I'd finished working there, I then got told by the door staff uh, a story of what had happened there. So they had a new doorman join up and they decided that night that they would have some beers and some pizza with this guy and kind of initiate him. So what started off as a bit of rough and tumble, you know, normal guy stuff. And this is why I don't get involved with guys going out drinking because they start, you know, roughing each other up and doing all this kind of uh, like dogs, you know, pissing uh, on each other to trying to see who's the biggest dog. So they're doing this kind of hierarchical wrestling, arguing thing. And to me, again, we're starting to get into homoerotic vibes here of like blokes like taking their tops off and insisting on wrestling with each other and stuff. Like that is not my bag at all. So they're doing this with this new guy. They start pinning him down because he gets quite aggressive. He also doesn't want to play those games and uh, he gets quite aggressive with them so a few of them actually grab hold of him and pin him down things then got out of hand they actually pulled this guy's trousers and pants down and they're like pretending to do things to him things then got further out of hand one of them thought it'd be funny to go off to the kitchens this place was a, a restaurant as well as a club it was kind of a pub restaurant club all three at once and uh, they get a box of frozen sausages out of the deep freeze and one of them shoves this frozen sausage into this guy's butt. The problem was the sausage was deep frozen so it actually stuck to his bum and of course they've like tried to shove it in and out or whatever and it's damaged him. You know, it's done him some pretty nasty injuries and ripped his flesh, etc. So they've all like played it off and said, oh, you know, it's no big deal. And they think it's a great big laugh. This guy went off to the police and actually, you know, got charges pressed against these guys for like a sexual assault, which is exactly what it was. And that kind of behavior was fairly common. I mean, I don't mean the kind of deprived sausage stuff. That's very unusual. But that kind of hazing, kind of... Uh, dominating sexualized behavior between the men of this kind of homophobic but also um very kind of sexually excitable in terms of the, the homosexual sort of side of things it was very much like that and i hated that kind of stuff you know a few times when i met these guys outside of work for uh, drinks or whatever 
and guys used to immediately try and do all that stuff with me grab hold of me and what and as soon as they did i would go for them you know and it was kind of like um prison mentality that you could not show that you were at all um going to take any of that behavior you know and they used to com complain they'd play the victim then and go oh why are you being harsh to me man we're only messing about and i'd say you know keep your fucking hands off me do not touch me i don't want any of you muppets thinking that you can start ragging me about you know and they would kind of say i was grumpy and mean and stuff but that was the only way i found to keep these guys in a sort of subdued and sensible manner because if you let them you know they would all be all over you basically they would be just uh, uh intimidating you and they would all find that hilarious and you would be kind of the the butt of their jokes and that was not something i was prepared to be so i didn't like any of that attitude i didn't like that scene i'm not one of those kind of jock guys that thinks that's all a great big laugh and that kind of bleeds into as well the way these guys treated girls because i think a lot of those guys actually were um probably harboring homosexual feelings and were trying to make up for it by being ultra macho and all this kind of stuff and part of that was then you know seeing how many girls they could sleep with for example and just having zero respect for these girls and this was kind of the classic image of a doorman that was trying to have sex with as many girls as possible per night i was um lucky enough to meet some nice girls over 23 years you know i probably met i don't know 10 or 20 girls in that period that are kind of like dated and, and whatever and we had some fun but it was a mutual like pleasant situation where we were going out on dates we were meeting each other it was a nice time and i had a lot of offers from girls in that time where they would come up drunk in the club and say let's go outside and do whatever sexual act i had loads of them girls that were trying to get into the club that were offering me stuff and frankly i've got zero interest in having sex in a dirty toilet i've got zero interest in going outside into like a freezing cold english uh, winter's night and trying to perform a sex act on the side of a you know up against a wall outside a dirty alley that to me is not a interesting sexual encounter especially with someone who's absolutely wasted um, i'm not at all interested in having sex with super drunk girls because you know where's the mutual kind of enjoyment in that that's part of the enjoyment of having sex with someone is it some sort of mutual situation where you're both having a great time and if she's kind of uh, half on the way to puking her drinks up then that's probably not her having a very good time also you've got to remember these were different times but nowadays that would be a huge issue when it comes to consensual kind of stuff going on you know so uh, that's a big a big big problem that i don't know if that still happens in the industry but if it does then there's a very big issue there because there were definitely doormen that were preying on and looking for drunk females to you know try and uh, take home or try and give a lift to so girls always watch out for that if they if you've got some doorman paying you lots of attention and say oh i'll give you a lift home i'll give you a lift home you know he's probably not saying that because he's got a um hobby of driving people around in his car he's saying that obviously because he wants to have some kind of sexual encounter with you when he takes you home or not home as the case may be so just be aware you know and that was something i really wasn't into i didn't kind of judge people too much for it but i certainly did judge the guys who treated the girls disgustingly those weren't guys that i was impressed with in fact i had um, big fallings out with a few guys like that and there was quite a few doormen, much more than I would have liked, who were involved in domestic violence. So they would come into work and unbelievably they would tell the other doormen about this stuff and say, oh, my missus got out of hand, so I, you know, give her a backhander. And I would be like, what? You know, you're just telling people that? I, I thought these guys were joking at first. And actually I even witnessed guys doing that to girls, you know, their wives turned up or girlfriends turned up and there was you know uh, domestic violence situations occurring which i then had to get involved in and basically grab these guys from behind and uh, drag them away pretty much choke them unconscious because they were freaking out and uh you know i really didn't like those guys and i'd have to say to them 
if I had the control, I would say you can't work for me anymore. And if I didn't have control, I would just say we cannot be friends. You know, you're not the kind of person that I want to be associated with. Because if your relationship's that bad, you just walk away. You leave the relationship. You know, you can never make a relationship better, whether it's a man or a woman, whoever you're in a relationship with. It's never going to be made to work by committing acts of physical violence on the other person in that relationship. That's going to only go seriously downhill. I haven't ever heard of a relationship having that and then, you know, getting better afterwards. Like, there's no benefit to doing that. It's a disgusting way to treat someone that you say that you love. Now, a lot of people have asked, did the doorman take loads of steroids? Uh, in answer to that, there was a percentage that did. So there were quite a large amount of doormen that were fairly obvious because they were absolutely massive. They were clearly bodybuilders. I was powerlifting at the time and it was obvious to most people, you know, which ones were taking gear. I didn't really see that as too much of an issue. This whole myth around um, people that take gear, they suddenly switch into crazy people from what I experienced, gear was a little bit like um, people that drink. You know, not everyone who drinks turns into an arsehole. But if these guys were aggressive, unpleasant, nasty, narcissistic guys in the first place, the addition of too much testosterone certainly wasn't going to help things, you know. So, yes, that probably made those guys worse. Um, but equally, there were a lot of guys that took their gym really seriously, that were very dedicated you know, kind of serious athletes that were into some pretty extreme kind of sporting achievements and stuff like that who were using gear. And for them, I didn't really see any change in their personalities. They were very dedicated guys. They would come to work, eat their food that they'd pre-prepared, you know, be even sometimes training at work, doing a few press-ups between um, bits of work that they were doing or doing a bit of jogging and stuff like that. They were super dedicated they were very confident guys they had no reason to show off or misbehave and they were fine so i wouldn't say that it was the taking steroids alone that was causing any problems you know if that's why people are asking about it i would say that there was two kind of types of people there was these dedicated sports guys that took them for bodybuilding or for powerlifting or for whatever sport that they were doing that were very sensible guys that had no issues at all. And then there were kind of these authoritarian idiot bully boy guys that just added steroids in as another thing to do. You know, they were probably already drinking too much themselves. A lot of those um, bullyish doormen were sniffing coke all the time. So that was kind of giving them a, a bad attitude as well. And then on top of that, they were taking steroids. And then on top of that, they were violent, nasty, narcissistic individuals anyway. So that whole recipe for, you know, someone to be in charge of a bunch of people trying to keep them safe, that was far from ideal. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that that still exists, you know, that the, these authoritarian bully boy types are still around and still behaving in the same manner, still treating girls like crap, still taking drugs and filling themselves full of gear and, and going around pushing people around. Things have changed. You know, the I see doormen now, the vast majority of door staff are these kind of uh, young, skinny, kind of clipboard holding, badge wearing little guys and girls that are just there to record information you know the idea now that bouncers and doormen are there to kind of get hands on with people and throw people out or do some fighting that's pretty much long gone of course there will be still clubs that have those guys but the majority are going to be your kind of SIA jacket filling dudes most of the security positions now they just exist because the licensing on the club and the insurance policies on these clubs and pubs require them to have X amount of door security. So the places that purchase the door security, they want to get the cheapest possible security guys because they're just tick, you know, they're just ticking these boxes, tick box uh, security. So they're going to get five guys in. That's the minimum requirement that they need. They're going to get the cheapest possible guys. So they're going to end up with a bunch of incompetent skinny you know uh, useless kind of door security 
who are going to stand around with their clipboards and then nicely ask people to behave themselves and when that doesn't work they're just going to do nothing and that's exactly what we see when we see stores getting robbed and stuff now the security just stand there and do zero in fact most of them have policies then they're not even allowed to do anything so a lot of the comments that i've made about security may or may not be viable anymore you know you can probably look at the the doorman and, and tell what kind of guy you're dealing with if it's this clipboard muppet or if it's actually the kind of guys i was talking about who were literally there to throw people around i hope that has answered some questions i'm sorry door security guys if you're one of the nice ones and i've made your industry sound bad but you probably know like i know that a lot of that goes on and uh, it's just the, the shame of the industry, unfortunately, and another reason why I don't do it anymore. If you've got any comments or experiences of this kind of thing, chuck them down below. Look forward to hearing them, and I'll catch you all next time.